this long, it's multiple choice, put your name on it somewhere and, take, and fill it out. Um, you have to do, there's, it's attached to a reading. You just have to read the first paragraph of the reading, really actually just the first sentence of the reading is, is, um, is all that's necessary to answer the question. Um, and so on your way out, pick that up and then bring the um, filled out uh, uh, homework assignment with you to the, to the discussion sections tomorrow. Um, Emily also has, in addition to the homework assignment, has the graded uh, quizzes that were due yesterday, um, so you can pick those up. Uh, the answer key is up on Blackboard. You can use that to study for the exam coming up on Friday. Uh, and, um, uh, and so tomorrow, there are discussion sections. Um, five people have discussion sections starting at 2.30 over around the corner in uh, 5403. Um, five of you are going to be starting at 325 at 5403. Um, and the last five of you or four of you or something are going to be here at 325. So make sure you know where you need to be tomorrow and what time you need to be there and bring your um, very short homework assignment with you. Um, we have class from uh, 3.10, no, 4.10 until 4.50. Um, so the second half of class period here all together, the whole group. Um, and we'll sort of discuss and recap some of the things from the discussion section and recap some of the main ideas overall. Uh, and then the final exam, you have a two hour time block to do it. Any two hours that you like between, is, uh, I will be, either I or somebody else will be in room 5403 the entire day from 8.30 in the morning until 5.30 in the afternoon. And so you pick your own two hour time block to come and take the test in that time window. Uh, and um, yeah, and so if, and uh, Emily will be available after class tomorrow for any last minute questions um, that people have. Uh, I think, did you already post the review slides okay. from yesterday? Okay, yeah, so she's gonna post the review slides from yesterday for anyone who'd missed the review. Um, and then, uh, so if you have last minute questions, um, just uh, please uh, you know, send us emails, come talk with Emily after class tomorrow, uh, let us know uh, how, uh, what questions you have. Okay, so before we get started with, um, the new material from today, um, what questions do people have about the last couple of days of class, what we're gonna be doing tomorrow, the final, what you need to know, anything that people are unclear on with that? Okay, so, oh yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, nothing really. Uh, it happens. It's fermentation. Um, if you understand fermentation in eukaryotes, you're doing fine. I don't think there's. I don't think there's anything about alcohol in particular. Um, or if there is, instead of making lactate, you make alcohol and CO2. And if you know that, then you're definitely good on that. And and certain organisms like yeast and some bacteria will do that instead of making lactic acid, lactate. Yeah. Any other questions about material, class stuff? Okay, so today is the second lecture about development. Um, the, uh, the vi I sent out, late last night I sent out a link to a 10 minute-ish video about animal development um, that uh, the subtitle of which is, we're basically just tubes. Um, and that's kind of the theme of today's lecture too, is you're a tube and, um, and this is how you got to be a tube. And you're a tube with these layers of uh, different types of tissue. Um, and, uh, and then there's a lot of additions and complexities added on top of it, but you're kind of just a tube. Um, and so you didn't start out as a tube, you started out as a ball. This is the head of a pin, um, a metal, metal pin that you would use to like sew or something. Um, and this is a mouse embryo um, at about the 16 cell stage, I think, maybe 32 cell stage. Um, uh, similar in size to a human embryo at that stage. Um, so you were once that small, um, you were once one cell when you were an egg that was fertilized. Um, and then after a few rounds of mitosis, you looked like this. 
Um, and then after a little bit more time, as we described last time, um, you went from this morula, which is this sort of indistinct cell ball that has these totipotent cells into the inner cell mass, which is going to be you, and the, um, and the uh, trophoblast, which is going to become the placenta. Um, and since I'm, since I'm not a placenta, I'm sort of biased against caring about what the placenta does. I'm, very important for a lot of things, but this inner cell mass then starts making some decisions, and the first decision that it makes is whether it's going to become, is some cells become ectoderm and some cells become endoderm, and then very soon after that, um, there's a middle group of cells that become mesoderm, um, and uh, and then the uh, endoderm, the thing that's easiest for me to remember for the endoderm is that it's the lining of your intestine. Um, there are a few other things, liver, pancreas. Um, you should remember one, but you don't, uh, it kind of doesn't matter to me which. For mesoderm, there's something called the notochord, which is only present in an embryo. And while I don't have a notochord anymore, um, I'm very happy I did once because as we'll learn today and discuss more tomorrow, um, it is why I have a brain. And so I'm glad to have had it at one point. Um, and so, uh, so there's a notochord, um, and then other things like muscles and so on. Um, and then endoderm, or sorry, ectoderm, skin, and brain. And this is for the second half of today and all of tomorrow, we're going to be talking about that decision, how the ectoderm cells decide whether to become skin or brain. Um, so that's kind of recap from last time. Um, we talked about a lot of different things last time and didn't quite have enough time to completely finish talking about, um, about Hox genes, these homeobox genes. Um, I, I was sort of starting to, to, to make the point that, um, that um, changes, you don't even have to change which, you don't even have to mutate the Hox genes, you just change the regulation of them so that there's no overlap or so that there's, so that there's perfect overlap between them and you can lose an arm, you can lose your arms. Um, or if you do change the Hox genes so that they become a little bit more active, then you can go from having a short neck to a long neck with just a change to one or two genes. Um, and so Hox genes are actually um, very interesting from an evolutionary point of view because um, evolution doesn't necessarily need to be as gradual as we often think it is, but you can have, um, have a mutant animal born with mutations in the Hox genes that has a dramatically different phenotype and dramatically different body structure. Um, many times these sorts of mutations would be maladaptive, but occasionally it's useful to have no arms because you can slither into a burrow more easily, or it's useful to have a long neck because you might win out on a fight or reach higher branches or whatever. Um, so, um, so Hox genes are interesting evolutionarily um, because of this capacity that they have to, um, to cause rapid evolution. So Hox just means that it's very low in the actual um, Right. So, you know, we have, we have Bicoid and Nanos, and they turn on Hunchback and Caudal, and they turn on God knows what Gap genes, and then they turn on some other pair rule genes, and then they turn on some other segment polarity genes, and then finally they turn on Hox genes, and then finally, finally, finally the Hox genes turn on something that actually makes a darn organ, and we've got um, an arm. And so, um, you know, it's this sort of like transcription factor activates, transcription factor activates, transcription factor, and you're like, my God, when are we ever going to do anything but turn on more transcription factors? And finally, when we get to the Hox genes, that's where we're going to turn on something that's not just more transcription factors. They are transcription factors, but what they turn on, some of it is transcription factors, but a lot of what they turn on is actually doing stuff. And so it's sort of where we're finally getting past this transcription factor cycle to getting to making actual proteins that do something else other than turn on other genes. So, yeah. Other questions about that? Um, so a few other uh, reminder reminders. Um, so faculty course evaluations. Uh, um, we are close to our goal to get everybody a bonus point. Um, if we just have like a, two more people fill them out, then everyone gets bonus points. Um, so I will be very excited about that if that happens. Plus, I, the, I, the way I, the whole reason I'm excited about those is because they tell me how to improve this class. Um, we do, we have a whole week on evolution. Last summer we had a, a, a day on evolution. There were, there were 
two or three people in the faculty course evaluations that said they wanted more evolution. Um, and so we got to spend more time on that. Um, that came at the expense of a little bit of the chemistry that we did. Um, if that was a decision that you were happy about, then let me know. If you wish there were more chemistry, let me know. If you think that the order of material could be improved, let me know. If you think there are topics that we should remove or spend more time on, whatever. Please, any, anything that you can tell me to help me improve the course is always, always very valuable. Um, for me, um, uh, it, um, it is most enjoyable when I find ways to continually um, um, uh, improve my courses. And so I really value that feedback that I can get through those. Um, and so whether there are things that you like or don't or a mix of both, anything you, you want to share is very, very valuable. Um, like I said a minute ago, somebody will be around the corner on Friday um, from 8.30 in the morning until 5.30 in the uh, evening. Um, pick a two-hour time slot, come take your final exam anywhere in there. Um, and then uh, we already had one review last night, but Emily's posting the materials from that. And, um, and we're available via email, and Emily will be here uh, tomorrow after class with office hours too. Um, I'm going to be available for a about an hour long period, maybe an hour and a half before class down in my office tomorrow if people have questions during that time period as well. Okay, so back to you and back to you being a tube. Um, so fertilization um, happens when a sperm and an egg meet. Um, and, uh, and there's a whole process involving calcium signaling and everything that goes on with fertilization. Um, and then in the first couple of days after fertilization, about once per day, there's, um, there's a, there's a mit mitosis happens. Um, you go from being one cell to two to four to eight. And then, um, and then the uh, mitosis actually speeds up a little bit so that by day five and six, um, you're um, uh, 30 or 40 cells. Um, and, then, and then we begin this process of differentiation, where one cell goes down one path and another cell goes down a different path. And so they, um, they make decisions about who's going to be the, um, the placenta, who's going to be the organism. Then once we figured out who's going to be the organism, then we start to say, okay, well, what parts of the organism are we going to be? Um, and um, the, the way that I... So I'm going to actually take advantage of colors here um, and do a lot of this over on the board uh, over here. Um, so as this inner cell mass grows, um, it begins to differentiate itself. And there is one side of it that we typically draw on the top, although it's, you know, that's just a reference point. Um, and, we, and it's got a, a name that I hate, but you see a lot, and so we're going to, I'll tell you what it is. Um, it's called the animal pole. Um, and up, up at the animal pole, um, the stuff that's up there is all um, ectoderm. And then there's another name that I equally hate um, for the stuff at the bottom which is called the vegetal pole. Um, and then all of this stuff here is endoderm. And then in the middle, between them, is mesoderm. And so I, I like to think of this as sort of the stacked pancake stage. You've got endoderm, and stacked on top of that is mesoderm, and stacked on top of that is ectoderm. And so that is our, our, um, our organism is a ball, but this ball has three layers, one stacked on top of the other at this stage. And this is around the time in mammals where the, organism, where the, the, the developing embryo begins to get implanted into the uterus, um, that, that these differentiations start. And this all comes Yes, that's right. Yeah, we're going to stop talking about the placenta because it's not us, and, and that's not, yeah, I'm sort of biased against it. Um, there is some signaling and some process going on in the placenta and communication within the placental cells, communication between the placental cells and the uterine cells in the female's reproductive system that help to provide support for this uh, developing embryo. But yeah, we're just ignoring all of that. OK, um, all right. and so. Uh, and so this is 
uh, over here, this is our, um, our early gastrula or our late morula. Um, so, it says, you can call it a late morula slash early gastrula. Um, morula, that just means ball. Gastrula is when we get into the tube zone. Um, so we're just about, we haven't quite gotten to be a tube, but we're kind of working our way toward tube here. Um, and, so, uh, and so this is, and then the first big event after implantation and the sort of segregation of the placenta and starting to determine these cell layers, the first sort of big event where you, something kind of impressively visual happens to this developing uh, embryo is that it starts to suck the endoderm inside. So it's sort of like sucks in that endoderm inside and there's this little hole here called the blastopore that begins to form. Um, and, that, and then the endoderm is going to get sucked into that hole and the mesoderm is going to sort of get sucked in behind it. And as that hole begins to suck in the endoderm, we're going to transition Um, from a ball of cells that has stacked pancake arrangement, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, to a ball of cells that has what I call the layered onion arrangement, where now um, if we take a cross section through it, Um, we get something like this, where the outer shell is ectoderm, the middle shell is mesoderm, and then the inner shell is endoderm, and then there's this this hole that's running through. Before there were so before there was a hole too, the blastocele, but the blastocele important for some stuff, but um, again, I'm kind of biased toward what I am now, and I don't have a blastocele anymore. That's not part of, that's, that doesn't represent any part of me. But this new hole that we're forming actually is representing something that's still here in me right now, which is my um, digestive system. And in fact, this little hole, the blastopore, represents the back end of my digestive system. So the first thing that, that um, forms when you're developing is the bottom side of your digestive system. Um, and then eventually this is going to form my digestive system and another hole will form out the other end, which will be my mouth. Um, and so um, this is now the early formation of the digestive system and you can already start to see why the endoderm forms the lining of the digestive system. Um, so this is sort of, so, so, and so we've got this sort of layered onion stage what I call the layered onion stage. So back over here, this was our stacked pancakes. Now we transitioned over into layered onion. Um, and the more proper term for this would be a late gastrula. So the blastocele just disappears? Yes. Yes, the blastocele just disappears. And in fact, in this last image here, you can see it's all gone. Slide like two slides ago, it shows the pancake still yes. the edges of the here, maybe down, here. Uh, down one. Yeah, so this thing that's already detached from the um, the I don't know what's the thing that becomes the uh, the, the the no, it's still so I mean it's still connected. So the, the, the placental so if we back up here, we're we're just ignoring the placenta in this slide, but it's connected up. Here we're just not showing the placenta connected here because we're not paying attention to it, but it is. I mean, this is what it looks like in the organism, and this is this sort of like yellowish stuff here is the developing placenta, and um, and so the, it it is physically attached to the placenta. We're just here. We're just we just cropped that out of our PowerPoint slide. We just we just photoshopped out the placenta because we don't care about it. So the thing that gets 
bottom. Yes. Yeah, the endoderm, which is the bottom part of this. And then yeah. the blastocoel is the hole in the top part? Yes. But yeah, yeah. yeah. And some, or, so actually, this is a sea urchin, and sea urchins have holes in the top. No, sorry, I, backwards. This is a mammal. Mammals have holes in the bottom and the top. This one's called the blastocoel. This one I don't even remember the name of. This is a sea urchin. Sea urchins don't have a hollow space in the bottom. Details, not so, not so interesting to me anyway, because those holes don't really represent anything. Um, yeah. Um, okay, and so we'll skip past that a little bit about cell adhesion. Um, but uh, so this is a, a diagram showing an adult and what parts of the adult come from those three different layers. So the ectoderm, um, again, I really hope that everybody knows this by the end of today. Um, the ectoderm represents the skin, the epidermis, the outer layer of the skin, and the nervous system. So the brain, um, a lot of the sensory nerves, and so on. Um, also the lining of the mouth, uh, uh, epithelial lining in the mouth. Um, epithelial lining of the, of the rectum um, as also part of the eye um, and there are a couple other places where it shows up too but not very much. Um, some glands are made of ectoderm as well. Um, but actually most glands are made of endoderm um, and, uh, and so like this, this, these blue lines here are supposed to represent the nerves. Um, mesoderm is actually by mass most of your body, your bone, your muscles, um, the muscles, the musculature that surrounds your digestive system, the musculature that surrounds the lungs, the, um, the blood vessels, the blood itself all comes from mesoderm. Um, and then the lining of your digestive system as well as some of your digestive organs like your liver, um, a few glands like your thymus and thyroid, um, uh, and your pancreas which is behind your stomach there um, are all endoderm derived. Um, and, uh, and one other thing that's mesoderm derived that is not shown here is the notochord, and that's only present in the embryo. Um, and so for this, uh, you know, you should know both of these for the ectoderm. Again, I'm going to be crying if anyone doesn't remember those two. Um, mesoderm, pick one of the top three, and then also remember the notochord. And uh, endoderm, you should, you know, interlining the digestive system is the easiest thing for me to remember, but whatever you want to think about is fine. Yeah, the dermis is the inner layer of the skin. Yeah, it's the connective tissue in, in the skin, so um, not the part that's exposed, yeah. Um, and, yeah, I mean, actually, it's really just like the, outer, the, the inner lining of the digestive system and the outer lining of the skin that are not mesoderm. Most of you is mesoderm. Okay, and so this is just um, summary, this is just sort of a summary of the, the previous two slides um, where you have stacked pancake, then it starts to suck in. This is forming the back end of the digestive system here. The, the intestines, the, the, the digestive system as a whole, including the stomach and everything, is starting to form here. And then eventually you go from stacked pancakes to layered onion stage, um, where you now have um, ectoderm on the outside, mesoderm beneath that, and endoderm on the inside with this hole in the middle where the gut is. Okay, so any questions about that? Yeah, sure. So that dotted line is the hole. Yeah, yeah. I can't find my black marker right now. I would use black, but yeah, this is this is our gut here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess dotted is a little confusing. I'll just make another green line. Um, okay, so, so uh, then down at the bottom there, it says, after this, the body begins to elongate into a cylinder. And so um, this is sort of a sphere, but you can imagine it's sort of getting longer, like this way, into a little bit more of a cylindrical shape. So if we um, rotate it 90 degrees, then um, it would look like this where again we've got ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm, and then a little bit of endoderm going out like this. Um, and then, so this is the gut space endoderm, 
um, mesoderm and ectoderm. And so here, in this view, this is going to be my back. This is going to be sort of my belly side. This is going to be right and left side of me. And then over here now, again, this is my back. This is my belly. This is head. And this is tail side. So we sort of, you know, at one point this was a sphere, and then it starts to elongate out, so it's more of a cylinder. But the cross section of the cylinder is, is a, very much like the cross section of the sphere. Um, and then we just sort of elongate out like this. Questions about that, sort of picturing that in three dimensions? Okay, and so, oh yeah, sorry, there was, no, okay. Um, and so here's, um, you know, the three dimensions of a body. Um, so, uh, so we live in a three-dimensional world. To specify something, you need to specify it in three dimensions. Um, anterior toward the head, posterior toward the tail. Tail is in quotation marks here because in humans our tail um, uh, degrades away, much like our notochord that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, right and left are, uh, and then ventral or belly side and dorsal and back side. Um, and so actually you sort of start out I mean, like, kind of like this, like a snake with its head up, and then eventually you know, we go stand upright. Um, so all of a sudden our belly, instead, instead of our belly being down toward the ground, our belly faces forward when we're standing upright. But you can sort of think of like, uh, like a cat or something that's on all fours, um, where its, its belly faces down toward the ground and its back is up toward the ceiling. Um, OK, so, um, and so, uh, uh, Again, like those are all of the stages here, and then we so now now we're sort of getting into like okay, well, what happens? What's going to go on with all of this, and how are we? And, and now really we're going to move into this question of how do the ectoderm cells, in particular, make up their mind about whether they are going to become skin or um, brain? Because um, in a certain sense, it's the simplest, right? So if we Scoot forward here, back to this slide. Um, there's basically two tissue types that are ectoderms becoming, um, whereas the other cell, the other the other cell classes have to make a lot more decisions. And so it's sort of a simpler decision to look at. Um, and it turns out that it's interesting both from how it's accomplished and also what is um, uh, how we know what's going on um, and the history of the of the science behind this. So um, what we, uh, there's this part of the mesoderm that way back over here in our, back in our stacked pancake stage, there's this little corner of the mesoderm that we call the dorsal lip of the mesoderm. And if we keep track of the dorsal lip from this stacked pancake stage here, and we follow it, then um, when we get to layered onion stage, we find the dorsal lip here. And as it elongates, as the embryo elongates, what was the dorsal lip turns into this sort of rod-like structure. Um, and at this point, we don't call it the dorsal lip anymore. Now we call it the notochord. And um, one thing that's been known for over 100 years now is that the sections of ectoderm that are along the back of the body for, um, for vertebrate animals, um, including mammals, um, and some invertebrates as well, the sections along the back are going to this zone in here is going to become brain, and then all of the rest of this, all the way around here, this is going to be skin. And so there was this idea that being near the notochord is 
important for the formation of the brain. And actually, as we, as we sort of go from ball to sphere, we start to call it a neurula because the nervous system is starting to develop. I'm not going to even write that up there because that's not a term you need to know. Um, but there's sort of the next big milestone in development is going to be the development of the nervous system. And so there's this idea that something about being near the notochord is really helpful for that. And so the question then is, well, how, what's going on? How, what, what, what's, what matters about being near the notochord? <clears throat> and so uh, in 1927, um, uh, this woman, Hilda Mangold, um, uh, was doing some uh, uh, embryo development um, work. Um, the feminist in me kind of hates that the only picture I can find of her has her with her kid, but you never see that for male scientists. But anyway, that aside, um, uh, so, so what she did was she, would, she had two little tadpole embryos, um, and she took one tadpole and cut the dorsal lip out of it and stuck the dorsal lip onto a different tadpole at a, the other side. And so now what we've got is one little froggy embryo that has no dorsal lip and one little froggy embryo that has two dorsal lips. So we know if we leave it alone, then, then um, our, we're going to get uh, a little tadpole that has one head and one spinal cord running along the back. If we take um, this, this embryo that has two dorsal lips, it gets two notochords, one in the normal spot along the back, another notochord in, the, in an abnormal spot along the belly, and now this frog tar, tadpole develops two heads and two spinal cords along the two sides of its body. Um, it eventually can't, stops being able to, to survive and dies. Um, meanwhile, this one that we stole the dorsal lip away from develops no nervous system, and it gets nice skin covering, but there's no brain at all, and again, it doesn't live for very long either. Um, and so, based on this, I should, should say, I guess, dorsal lip transplantation should be the title of this slide. But based on this experiment, um, question you might ask uh, yourself is, um, how does the uh, notochord affect um, the differentiation of ectoderm into uh, skin versus brain? And in this particularly, like how, not just like presence or absence, but start to um, maybe come up with a, um, a hypothetical, um, a hypothetical mechanism, a hypothetical thing that the notochord might be doing that might may have this effect. So, what might the notochord be doing that has this effect? Um, so. We'll, let's take six-ish minutes, um, get together in a group, um, and write down answers to these questions, and then we'll come back and discuss it together as a whole class. Okay, it's gotten very quiet, so I think maybe people are getting close to being done. Uh, maybe just another 10 to 20 seconds to finish up, uh, and then we'll come back and discuss together. Um, okay, so I've started to, to write up here on the board a, uh, a, a little summary. It's kind of, before we get to those questions in particular, just want to summarize a little bit about what we've got so far. So step one, where we're sort of starting out, is before gastrulation, and we've got a few things going on here. So we've got our ectoderm, which is at this term that I hate, but we have to live with, animal pole. Um, we've got our endoderm, which is at this other term that I hate, vegetal pole. 
And then uh, after these two form, very soon after, and we'll kind of come back to this very soon after business, our mesoderm forms um, between them at the border. Um, and then uh, a part of the mesoderm is called the dorsal lip. Then we have gastrulation. So this is, here we are before, this, we're in sack pancake phase. And then over here after gastrulation, now we're going to go to layered onion tube phase. Um, and then when we're in the layered onion tube situation, now our dorsal lip gets a new name. We start to call it the notochord. Um, and, uh, and so, um, and so, okay, so that's sort of where we were before this, just to summarize that up there. Um, so what's the notochord doing here? Why, why, why have I spent so much time talking about the notochord? Why is it the only part of the embryo you have to know? Yeah, sure. So without it, the, the, um, ectoderm is predisposed to become skin. Okay, so sure, yeah. Yeah, so without it, without it, we have ectoderm becomes skin. Okay. And as a hypothesis on what it does, I guess we thought like maybe it signaled the cells around the ectoderm cells around it to um, generate regulatory transmission factors to make it nervous tissue. Okay, yeah, so, so our, uh, sorry, uh, notochord. Actually, here, let me just write it up here. So notochord, and so your idea was it releases some signal, and then that signal um, is, uh, is a sort of um, uh, turns, on a ner turns on the brain development pathway. Um, specifically in the ectoderm, in the ectoderm. Um, Okay, so that, that kind of answered both of these questions. How does nerve or affect this? It it's, it's determines what part's going to be the brain, and the mechanism, maybe it, it releases some signal that turns on a brain development pathway. Um, what other ideas did other groups come up with? Or other groups have the same idea? Same idea over there. What about you in the back? Basically the same thing. Okay, cool. Yeah, sounds great. Makes per yeah. That's I, I think this is exactly the right conclusion to come to from this. This is exactly what people thought was going to happen. Yeah, this is exactly what people are like. Yes, this is it. We've got it. Um, notochord releases the signal, and so then one question then that people start asking is, okay, well, what's the signal, right? And so we isolate, um, and we're not going to talk about how this was done, but you is we isolate the signal, and notochord releases a signal, and the signal. Um, they named it noggin. It's what the signal that turns on the head production, turns on the production of the brain. Um, and so the, um, here is a, an image taken from, I think, an older edition of your textbook, um, but, uh, but the new edition has essentially the same thing. The formation of the nervous system. The nervous system actually forms its own little tube because there's um, fluid that runs through the nervous system called cerebrospinal fluid. Um, but uh, the, the nervous system forms its own little tube, and the notochord is turning on that tube signal um, by releasing a variety of signaling molecules. There's like four or five different ones, um, but the one that's easy for me to remember is noggin, and so that's what I remember. Um, and so we've got the signal noggin that's being released here, and that signal is telling us where to make a brain. Anywhere you're not getting that signal, no brain. Get skin. Everyone good with that? Okay, and so, um, oh yeah, sure, what's up? So on the, the neural tube, there's more ectoderm around it. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because because this signal um, dies off with distance, and you know, in me, there's skin covering my brain, um, and so yeah, um, uh, you need to be pretty close to the noggin signal. Otherwise, you're not going to be that. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to be brain. And so right nearby, um, the the you get you get um, uh, you get. Um, the, the, the formation of the noggin signal. Actually, the formation of some of the, the sort of formation of the closure of the neural tube and the fact that you get it sealed off completely depends on some other signals as well. Um, one of which is um, a derivative of folic acid. Uh, and so if a woman is, um, this, this all happens, by the way, like two weeks after being pregnant, maybe even less, um, which is usually before somebody knows they're pregnant, is usually even before it's detectable. Um, and so women who might become pregnant are encouraged to take vitamins that include folic acid um, because the presence of folic acid is necessary for the neural tube to close fully. And if it doesn't, then you can actually have a partially open neural tube, um, and that leads to um, spina bifida is um, what happens when it doesn't close at the back end, um, and then uh, cleft palate and some other more serious um, um, deformations can happen if it doesn't close at the top end. Um, okay, so yeah, so but yeah, so we've got, so this is, this image here um, showing us sort of in our, in our, uh, in our um, neurula, lake gastrula tube stage. We're in the tube stage. Here's the gut. Um, and, uh, and now we've got our signaling molecule, noggin, plus some other stuff that's being released from the notochord. And, um, and what that's doing is to turn on brain development. Uh, yeah. Right, yeah, so the notochord is part of the mesoderm, but it releases a signal, and that signal, the receptors for that signal are on the ectoderm. So it's all ectoderm that's folding. I guess the mesoderm sort of gets dragged along a little bit. There's a little bit of mesoderm here. And actually, then the next thing that's going to happen in development, which is not really the focus of this, but the next thing that's going to happen in development is the neural tube starts releasing its own signals. And nearby the neural tube, the mesoderm starts to differentiate into muscle cells. Far away, the mesoderm starts to differentiate into um, into uh, like connective tissue, which will eventually become bone and uh, and blood and cartilage and other things that mesoderm turns into. Um, so, uh, so you know, th this is not the end of development. This is just one decision, and then that decision triggers the next decision, which is going to be the formation of musculature that originally formed start around the neural tube and then is going to migrate out as needed uh, in the organism. And so there's a lot of movement, a lot of migration, and a lot of signaling one thing, and then that signal will turn the target into something else. So in this case, the signal comes from mesoderm, in particular the notochord, and then it is received by the ectoderm. Um, but that is actually an important point that people sometimes get confused about. The notochord is critical for the formation of the nervous system, but it is not ectoderm, it's mesoderm. And then its signal is being released and the signal is affecting the ectoderm. And the ectoderm is what's actually gonna turn into brain or in the absence of the signal, it turns into skin. Yeah, other questions about that? Yeah, um, pretty much. There's this funky thing that happens in, in, uh, in um, vertebrates only, where um, a few cells at the very tip when the neural tube closes actually break off, and they form some of the peripheral nervous system. Um, but, but, but most of the central and peripheral nervous system is going to just all come off of that. So, yeah. Um. Okay, so, so um, 1928, we basically had this all worked out based on Hilda Mangold's work. Um, the, you know, some, some more work in the intervening decades began to figure out, well, what is this signal? Figured out what that is. Um, and then in 1954, 57, I can't remember exactly the year, um, this guy, P.D. P. D. Newcoop, 
um, uh, did um, uh, did his own set of experiments, and so he was he for for he was sort of like okay, we figured out the nervous system business. Now I want to back up a little bit because I want to know where the mesoderm comes from. Was the question he was asking, um, and so uh, and so to figure out where the mesoderm comes from, um, he, he, he knew what something that I already said, which is that the mesoderm shows up just a little bit later than the ectoderm and endoderm show up. And so he's kind of curious how that mesoderm, where that mesoderm comes from. Um, it's interesting for a variety of reasons. You're mostly mesoderm, so that's interesting by itself. Um, it's also interesting because the mesoderm, while it's not the nervous system, part of it, the dorsal lip, that becomes a notochord is vital for the formation of the nervous system. And so if we want to have a full understanding of where our nervous system comes from, we're going to want to know where that dorsal lip comes from and where the nemesiderm comes from. So, um, and so this is where these animal and vegetal pole uh, uh, business comes out. Um, and so, um, uh, and, and so what, what he did was um, he, so he knows that if you just leave um, these morulas alone, that they will develop ectoderm at the animal pole, mesoderm at the middle, and endoderm at the vegetal pole. So, he, so we already knew that. But what he decided to do is chop off the top, separate just the animal pole, so just ectoderm, just a big old chunk of ectoderm from the top of this embryo, um, and then ask what happens. Um, and when he does that, um, actually, before we talk about what happened with the mesoderm, so if you take a chunk of ectoderm by itself, no mesoderm around, um, and then if we just let that go for a while, what's that going to turn into? Who thinks that's going to turn into brain if we let that go for a while? Who thinks it's going to turn into skin? Okay, if, almost everybody raised their hand. Um, so uh, let me see. Let's pick on, so Rose, you raise your hand and haven't talked to it today. Not sure. Okay. What about, uh, what about you, Marina? What did you think? Why is it going to turn into skin? Yeah. No. Yeah, exactly. Here. Without, without, without the noggin, which came from our notochord, which is part of our mesoderm, we're going to become skin. We can sort of call this our default pathway here. Without the noggin, we're going to become skin. Okay, um, but so we're, we're curious about where the mesoderm comes from. And so cut off the animal pole by itself, no mesoderm. Another experiment that's not shown on the slide, you separate the vegetal pole by itself, no mesoderm. But then what he did is he cut the top off, cut the bottom off, and then stuck them back together. So now he's cut away what was going to be mesoderm. And then if you, you do that early enough, then mesoderm reforms at that border there. Okay, um, and so, so there's some sort of communication going on where there's something going on at the animal pole and something going on at the vegetal pole and then some sort of communication that happens where if they bring those two together, the border becomes mesoderm. So we've got some sort of communication. So. Um, And so um, what sort of communication might be happening, I guess we'll call this question three, such that our mesoderm forms only at the border of ectoderm and endoderm. So that's the next question. We'll spend maybe another four or five minutes talking. Um, okay, so I think most of the groups are finishing up here. So, um, so uh, I'm going to Pick on the people in the back because I haven't heard from them as much. What, what did you all decide is coming up here? What's going on um, with this? So we had two theories. Uh huh. Okay. And one of them was that there's a signal in the animal pole and a signal in the vegetal pole. And then 
Okay. Where they cross. So like either having both signals means that uh, they turn on some other uh, transcription factor that makes it more down the mesoderm path, or that they in some way cancel each other out and then the mesoderm okay. path is more like the default. Cross and either interact or cancel out. Okay, um, and that was one theory. What was the other theory? That was both theories. That was both theories. Oh, the cross or canceling were the two theories. I see. Okay, um, uh, so what, um, what, other, what other ideas do we have about what might be going on? Are there other thoughts about what's going on with this? Let's see. So Alex, pick on your group next. What did you all come up with for this? Okay. Okay, great. And so I heard, and I overheard this group a little bit, and it sounded like you had the same, same, same idea going on, but I didn't quite catch what you it was. It was yeah. Sort of the same idea. Okay, yeah. So, um, great. So uh, that's actually awesome. You all kind of came up with the same idea, and that's, um, uh, um, I think, impressive and, and uh, exactly right. Um, so, uh, and in fact, one of the things that we um, have learned since P.D. Newcoop did that experiment is that the, the ectoderm up at the animal pole is releasing a signal called BMP, which stands for bone morphogen protein, another thing that is in the list of many, many terrible names in biology because there's no bone in the ectoderm. But it was first found in the mesoderm and tri triggered bone development. Turns out that it also is in the ectoderm, and it's just a like yay ectoderm signal. Um, so, um, so it's sort of a social signal. Is releasing a social BMP signal, and confusingly enough. You would think that if the signal is BMP, we would call the receptor for it the BMP receptor, but we don't. The signal binds to a receptor called the activin receptor. Um, and when the signal binds to the activin receptor, then it sort of is like a yay ectoderm sort of thing. So. Meanwhile, the endoderm is releasing its own signal, um, this, it's, a, its own social signal, its own sort of peer pressure signal. Um, that signal is called nodal, um, and I honestly don't even remember what the name of the receptor is, um, so we're just going to say that it binds to the nodal receptor. And that's a sort of yay endoderm signal. And so what we've got going on here then, back to our um, layered uh, sort of stacked pancake situation, is up here we've got an ect the ectoderm, and there's all this BMP floating around. Um, if we zoom in even closer, sort of zoom in right here, we might see a couple ectoderm cells. So now this is, this is our whole embryo. And then over here, we're just zoomed in on two neighboring ectoderm cells. And, these, and so this cell here is releasing some BMP. This cell here is also releasing some BMP. There is, they both have active end receptors. Um, and the BMP signal is going to bind to the active end receptors. Um, they also, and I, these are, um, by the way, the active end receptor, just as a little side note, is part of the larger family that we've talked about already that's a receptor tyrosine kinase. And what that's going to do is turn on a whole bunch of things, phosphorylate something, phosphorylate something else, and eventually you're going to go into the nucleus and alter transcription. So BMP going around is going to sort of reinforce our ectoderm. Um, there are also, hanging out on these cells, some nodal 
receptors, but we're up here in the ectoderm, no nodal around, right? So the only thing being active, the only, the only signal out there is BMP, so the only thing that we're turning on is the active end receptor. Does that make sense to everybody? We've got the receptor for nodal, we're just not, don't have any nodal around to turn it on. Any questions about that? Okay, so then way down here, we're um, way down here in this zone, we're in solidly in endoderm territory. Um, and over here, we've got a lot of nodal floating around. Now that nodal is binding to nodal receptors. These cells also have active end receptors, but there's no BMP to bind to them. So they all turn into to, uh, endoderm. And then in the middle, this is where the signals collide. And, um, and so where the signals collide, we now have nodal plus BMP, so all of the cells are getting both receptors activated, and uh, it's really kind of more, they're not really canceling each other out, it's sort of more the, um, the, the um, combination. So over here, we're getting a combination of BMP, which turns on the active end receptor, plus nodal, which turns on the nodal receptor, and so these cells decide to become mesoderm. Sort of like, um, uh, I guess actually a lot of you are in high school, but it's sort of like the, 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 the caricature of like what I remember of high school where it's like, you know, there's the one in group that's like all really into being, uh, being ectoderm together and they're all like, yay, team ectoderm. And so we've got this one click of ectoderm cells and they're all talking with each other and reinforcing that they're all happy to be ectoderm together. And then you've got this other click that's all really excited about being endoderm and they're all talking with each other and excited about this. And then at the border, you've got these, these uh, cells that don't really fit in with either click. And so they go and form their own uh, group together that uh, is all sort of separate from it and we call that the mesoderm. So that's how you end up with these three different tissue types. Okay, so what questions do people have about all of that? Okay, um, so <clears throat> oh yeah, sure, what's up? They eventually start emitting their own signals, but for the early stages of differentiation, I mean, they're actually kind of releasing both signals as well, like some of them are releasing the ones that's, that are in the bottom half are releasing a little bit of nodal. The ones that are at the top half are releasing a little bit of uh, BMP. But, um, but since, the, but since there, it diffuses over some distance, a lot of the cells are getting sort of both signal. Eventually, as they become more and more differentiated, this is, this is really just like, I mean, this, seem, this seems like a complicated set of things to remember, and it's certainly a lot of steps and a lot of sort of things to keep straight for, you know, having a final exam coming up in two days, trying to keep all of this state straight. There's a fair amount here. But in fact, it's way, way, way more complicated than this. There are like six signals going on in the ectoderm, like 20 signals going on in the endoderm. The mesoderm picks up some combination of those, and then it has their own signals too. And so we're ignoring a lot in this. Um, but yeah. Um, actually, I, I, well, we'll just leave it how it is. Um, one ex experiment that you might consider is if you have no, if, if you have an embryo that doesn't have an active end receptor, doesn't have a BMP receptor, then would you expect to get any mesoderm at all in that embryo? Any thoughts on that? Maybe give everybody a minute to kind of discuss that. So, so given what we talked about so far, if there's no if there's no active end receptor, no BMP receptor, what's going to happen to those cells at the bottom and then the border? Are they going to get? Are they going to become mesoderm? Let's take kind of a minute or a minute and a half and kind of discuss that and try and come up with some idea.
There's no active interceptor at all. at all, anywhere in the whole embryo. So uh, is there any uh, Everything else is the same. The only thing we've done is gotten rid of the active interceptor. No, because they're not getting any active in sig they're not getting any VMP signal. The ectoderm cells do. Yeah, the ectoderm's gonna the ectoderm's gonna be screwed up for sure if we do this. But my question was just like what's gonna happen with the mesoderm? Yeah. So yeah. So the ectoderm's screwed okay, yeah. So it's, it sounds like people have sort of got some ideas on this. So the ectoderm's definitely gonna be screwed up. And actually we're gonna come back to that a little bit tomorrow. Um, but but um, but for our mesoderm, what would we expect is gonna happen there? So no BM so so what so here they were, they're getting, they've got nodal and BMP, but are they, are they sensing the BMP? Is it, is it affecting anything in the cells? No, right? There's no receptor for it. So, so we're not going to get any mesoderm here. These cells at the border would probably also turn out to be endoderm, and then our ectoderm is going to be screwed up in ways that we're hard to predict um, from this. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Um, all right, so... Um, okay, so um, one more assignment... Um, to, to do in a group. Um, again, kind of the groups that you've got are fine. Um, so right now up on the board, we've got BMP, nodal, and noggin are the three signals that we've written up here. Um, these two are mostly sort of local. Noggin comes from the uh, mesoderm and finds parts of the ectoderm as the target. Um, but of those three signals, um, which of them um, are which? Which one or which one or maybe one or two or, or which all three? Which what? Which ones of them are important for this decision of how of ectoderm becoming skin or neurons? Um, and then how does the embryo know where to put its nervous system? How does it know that it's supposed to go along the back? Which embryonic structure controls the location? And then finally, in the absence of any signals at all, if we just got rid of like all the signals all together. The ectoderm cells, what are they going to become? So what is it? And then the final thing, which should have been, I guess, question four, is justify briefly in a couple sentences your answer for question number three. Sounds like the discussions are slowing down a little bit. So um, uh, we're going to skip past the first couple questions and actually also the third, the third the, just the first half of the third question. Don't even worry about this how do you know part here. Just in the absence of any signal, the default plan for the ectoderm is to become what? And so I want everybody to like write either an S for skin or an N for neuron somewhere on a piece of paper. Um, I, I, every individual, not every group. Um, and then give everybody 10 seconds to do that. Um, and then everybody needs to raise their hand and pick one. There's no, there's no not raising your hand for this thing. Um, and, so, um, and so who thinks that the default no signals is skin? Okay, who thinks the default with no signals is neuron? Kyler, are you up for skin or neuron? Sorry, <laughs> disregard that. <laughs> you, you skin? Yeah, I'm skin. All right. Great, yeah, so that's, um, uh, uh, yeah, so um, I mean, that's, so that's, uh, I think, the, the best interpretation to, that, that you could make for this. That's um, exactly the, the conclusion that I, that I think everyone should have come to for question number three. Um, so, you know, anyone want to give a sort of brief justification for why we think the default plan is skin? Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so way back here, no notochord, no signal, no brain. So without, so without that, without, the, without this signal, without this noggin signal, without the notochord, no brain, or we go to skin by default. Over here, the ectoderm that's, get, that's not getting the signal is skin. The stuff that is switches over to brain. Um, over here, we take a chunk all by itself, no signals from mesoderm anywhere, all turns into skin. <clears throat> um, so which signal then is maybe the most important one? If you're going to pick one signal, it would be the most important one for determining the skin versus brain thing. Sure, yeah. Noggin signal, right. With the noggin, you get to be skin. No noggin, no skin. Um, and so how does it know where to put its nervous system? Well, it goes, way, it goes next to where the notochord is, right? Um, so along the back. Okay. Um, 
So what questions do people have about any of this stuff that's up here on the board, these sort of different points here? All of this is also recapped. I think the numbering is a little different, but it's recapped in the topics guide. Um, so, so yeah, but any, any questions about kind of the logic of this? Um, okay, so the experiment that you're going to read about tonight, really just the one sentence description experiment that you're going to read about tonight, um, is from this man on the left, Horst Gruntz, um, uh, and one of his colleagues. Um, and, um, and then another experiment that we'll talk a little bit about, that you don't need to read about in advance, but we'll talk a little bit about tomorrow, is, was done by this guy, Ali Hamati Bravanlu. Um, and so what Horst Gruntz did um, was to, um, instead of taking a whole chunk of ectoderm, like P.D. Newcoop did, and just like chop off all of this and leave it together as a chunk, he took that top part, chopped it off, and then broke all the cells apart so they were really far away from each other. And then he waited to see what's going to happen when those cells are really far away from each other. Well, how, how do they differentiate? That's the experiment that you get to read the one sentence summary of tonight and then answer a question about, and then you're going to start the discussions tomorrow talking about that, as well as recapping all of this. Um, and then the other experiment um, I kind of alluded to already that Ali Hamatri Bravanlu did was that he um, engineered an organism that had no functioning active in receptors. And he um, uh, uh, expected exactly as all of you predicted his hypothesis was that you were going to get no mesoderm and that all of this stuff would just be endoderm when you had this no um, no uh, active end receptor um, so those are the two experiments that you're going to talk about uh, that you're going, uh, going to talk about in discussion sections and then we'll recap them again in class um, just sort of as by way of reminders Five o'clock tomorrow after class, Emily is going to be here for office hours. I'll be down in my office from two thirty until three uh, until I guess two thirty until about th uh, uh, almost four o'clock. I'll be down in my office, um, and then some of you have discussion section around the corner at two thirty. Some of you are around the corner at uh, three twenty-five, and others of you are here at three twenty-five. If you don't know where you're going, come find me right now because you need to know for tomorrow. Um, and the last thing is please fill out your course evaluations if you haven't already. They're really, really valuable to me.